So today we're continuing our lesson on Unit 4. This is Lesson 2, uh, the minimum or maximum on an interval. So optimization, recall, is usually the idea of finding the best or the worst uh, example, the highest or lowest value in a certain interval, what's the cheapest cost, or what's the greatest volume you can make, or whatever you're doing. So we're always kind of looking for uh, these high or low points. So the easier type of question is when you are trying to find the extreme values on a closed interval. A closed interval, remember, means it has a beginning point and an ending point. So like here, this is a bit difficult to see, but it's asking on the interval from 4 to 3, uh, you know, uh, where are we looking? So, or from negative 4, sorry, to 3. So, you know, from this point all the way to this point, you can see there's an absolute min and an absolute max and they happen to be the local min and the local max at the same time since they are turning points. Now in the second question the absolute max on this interval from negative 3 to 3 is different. The max is actually up here, right? Which is the end of the interval. So you have to understand that when you're looking for the min or max in a closed interval your candidates are turning points, which is to say critical points, places where the derivative is zero, and also the end points of the interval. And there is no quick way of doing this uh, other than just making sure you check all of these possible values and then you state whichever one is the highest and the lowest. Um, if the function is continuous on that closed interval, it must have an absolute min and an absolute max. And again, this is a really interesting thing for like communication would be to prove why, right? Because if the function is continuous, then you know you're not dealing with any asymptotes, which means your pencil has to start and end after one sweep uh, of the curve, and it must have started and ended at a point, so it must have a highest and lowest point. Uh, so again, you can get a max at either a peak, remember a peak is a local max, or at the end point of the interval, and similarly for the min. So basically what we're going to be doing with these questions is we're going to check all the critical points, we're also going to add the beginning and ending of the interval, and then we'll simply you know, determine which one is the highest and which one is the lowest. So an algorithm, remember an algorithm is a, a series of steps to find the absolute min or max. If it's continuous and it has a derivative for every value of x in the closed interval, then it can be found using the following procedure. So this would mean if the function's differentiable. And it says here in the note that we're only going to be dealing with functions that are differentiable as opposed to f prime doesn't exist, but you should be able to deal with f prime doesn't exist, for example, in a, a cubic, or excuse me, a cube root function would be a good one uh, where you, you you know you could try but anyway uh, we will come to that if it comes up so f find the derivative find the critical numbers where you set f prime to zero or find where f prime doesn't exist evaluate f of x at the beginning at the end and at all the critical numbers and then you simply compare so whichever one is the highest whichever one is the lowest is your absolute min and absolute max Remember, an absolute min does not have to be a local min, right? Uh, it could be just the end point of the interval. So here it says find the absolute max and the absolute min for each of these functions. Now normally, again, a quadratic would only have one or the other. But in this case, because it's a closed interval, we, it will have to have both. So let's draw it, x squared minus 4x plus 3. So x squared minus 4x plus 3. Of course, we get a quadratic that normally you would look at this and say it has an absolute min, it doesn't have an absolute max. Now for GeoGebra, if you want to draw a function on a specific interval, what you say is you say function, and then you look what it look what it says. It says give so it's looking for three arguments. Give me what function to draw, what x value to start at, and what x value to end at. So I'm gonna ask it to draw the function f, but only between the numbers 0 and 3, since that's what 
our question is asking, right? If you go back to this, it's only looking between 0 and 3. So this is the quadratic when you're looking at it only between 0 and 3, again, in an, in an x direction. So looking at it here, you can see that f of 0 is 3, f of 3 is 0, and the critical point, which would be the derivative of f, and then the root of that derivative, right, which is occurring at uh, 2, so we check f of 2. So we have 0, 3, right? We have 2, negative 1, and we have uh, 3, 0. Uh, those are the three candidates in terms of what could be important in terms of this function. And of course, you know, this pretty obvious, which, which one's highest? B is the absolute max and C is both a local min and an absolute min. So if we were asked to find the absolute, let's just go back and just to check what we were asked. So it says, find the absolute max and minimum value for each function. So the absolute max, the number was three. The absolute min, the number was negative one. Right? We're just recording the Y value for the, uh, since it, that's what it asked for, right? It asked for the absolute min value and max value. So that's what the two of them are. Here is a slightly harder question, right? It's asking us for a cubic. Let's do this one mathematically first and then we will check it on GeoGebra second. So start with f prime. You get 6x squared minus 6x minus 12, right? Which would be our uh, derivative there once you've taken the derivative. Uh, it's not easy to solve that way so we'll factor out a 6 and we'll get x squared minus x minus 2 and then we can factor that a little bit further and we get 6. We need a sum of uh, minus 1 and a product of minus 2 so we get x minus 2 and x plus 1. So therefore our critical points f prime x equals 0 uh, at sorry there we go uh, f prime is 0 when x is x equals negative 1 and x equals 2. Now it, given our interval, right, we're only supposed to be looking between negative 2 and 0, so I'm going to go ahead and, and just remove uh, this one, right, because we don't, we're don't we not looking at x equals 2, it's not in the interval that we're drawing. So our candidates now, what we need to do, we need to check f of negative 2, uh, we need to check f of negative 1, and we need to check f of 0, right, so the, the, our absolute min and absolute max have to be uh, you know, you have to be found among those options. So f of negative 2 uh, is 2 times negative 8 minus 3 times 4 minus 12 times negative 2 plus 1, which is uh, negative 16 minus 12 plus 24 plus 1. So 28, negative 4, negative 3, I think. Uh, okay, then we have f of negative 1, which is a little easier to do, is negative 2 take away 3 plus 12 plus 1, which is going to be 8. And finally, we have f of 0, which is easiest of all, which is just 1. So looking at this, what I'm going to suggest is that the local, or excuse me, the absolute min is going to be found at negative 2, negative 3. I mean, the value is, is just the negative 3. The value is negative 3. The absolute max is going to be found at negative 1, 8. Uh, and again, the value is just 8. So uh, the, this one is also going to be a local max. The first one is not going to be a local max, if I've got this right. So let's draw this one. So 2x cubed take away 3x squared. So let's just, uh, just go back. So 2x cubed take away 3x squared uh, take away 12x plus 1, right? That's what we were... Okay, and we're only supposed to draw this function, so we're going to do a function f between negative 2 and 0, and that's going to remove that section, so we're only looking at this little section of the cubic here. Again, our candidates are negative 2 and f of negative 2 negative 1 and f of negative 1, and 0 and f of 0. Again, you can see the absolute min here is at negative 2, negative 3. 
the max is at negative one eight, and this zero one is just a neither point. It was a candidate, but it was neither. Uh, it turns out to be neither. Okay, uh, it's asking for one of the ones from the book here. I don't have that one, but maybe someone from the class could post it, post do it, and post it on the discussion forum. And uh, or you know, I think it'll be in the in the other notes, like the the smart notes um, from when I did it in a previous year. Let's try this. Um, or maybe this. Oh, sorry, I should have read further. I I think this is this just is the question. Sorry. Uh, so here we are doing a word problem. It says technicians uh, working for the Ministry of Natural Resources have found that the amount of a pollutant in a certain river can be represented by this function, where T is the time in years since a cleanup campaign started. At what time? was the pollution at its lowest level. Okay, so to do something like this, right, what we're going to do is, you know, so P of T, absolute values, must come from either P of 0, P of 1, or P of X, where, right, let's say P of C, hmm, not a little copyright symbol, there we go, where uh, P prime of C equal, <laughs> I should have picked a different number, p prime of c equals 0. Okay, so uh, p of 0 and p of 1, it probably isn't going to be either of those two, although we could check. Um, let's say, let's do p of 0. Uh, p of 0 is equal to um, 1 over 162 no, it's just 1 over 1. So P of 0 is just 1. So uh, that's, you know, the amount of uh, pollution is equal to 1. Now, at P of 1, you're going to get 2 plus 1 over 162 plus 1, which is, you know, let's say equal to, uh, where's my, like, approximately equal to? equals approximately 2 point, you know, whatever, 0.02 or some, 0.01 or something like that, right? Because this is a very small fraction. And we're looking for a minimum. In this minimum, there's no way that this is lower than uh, than this one, than P of T, right? So, uh, yeah. I, I don't think we need to bother. So, now let's look at the derivative. So we have two candidates. We have p of 0, we have p of 1. p of 1 is definitely not the answer, so we can get rid of that one. Uh, we know that one isn't going to be true. Now let's try the other thing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at uh, p prime of t, which is, okay, so let's take the derivative, right? So let, let's write it again just, in a, uh, just to remind us how this works. P of t is 2t plus 162t plus 1 to the power of negative 1, right? would be a good way to, to think about this one, so we can just use the power rule and the chain rule. So, uh, P prime of t is going to be 2 minus, right, because the negative 1 is going to come in the front, 162t plus 1 squared. Uh, sorry, to the negative 2, not squared, uh, times the value 162, right, which would be the inside of the uh, function's chain. So we get something that looks like this, p prime of t is equal to 2, subtract 162 over 162t plus 1 squared, something looks like that, and then we need to find out when that is 0. So we get p prime t, uh, so we'll replace this, sorry, with 0, and we're going to get, um, you know, uh, let, let's, well, let's just write it again, I guess. 62t plus 1 squared. Uh, there's a couple of different ways you can deal with this, right? You can, um, you can multiply everything by 162t plus 1 squared. You could bring the other fraction to the other side. Maybe we'll start with that first. So we'll bring this fraction to the other side equals 2. Right? Then we'll get rid of the denominator, like that, and we'll just get rid of, just cancel this, right? And kind of bring the denominator to the other side. 
Okay, and then what we have is 162, uh, let's just divide it actually, 81 equals 162t plus 1 squared. Right? Now when you square root 81, you get plus or minus 9 equals 162t plus 1. So two answers, right? 9 is 162t plus 1. So 8, 162t, and therefore t is 8 divided by 8 divided by 162, which is approximately equal to 0 0.05, right? Because 8 times 20 is 160. So uh, times 20, uh, yeah, I mean, it would be a little, it won't be exactly this number, but we'll, we'll get it. We use it on GeoGebra. Uh, the other answer would be negative 9 equals 162t plus 1. And then you get negative 10 is 162t. And then negative 10 over 162 is equal to t. But this is outside the domain, so we can ignore it. Uh, so our, our the derivative, the candidate we're going to look for is this number, 8 over 162. So let's go back to the original question. Do p of 8 over 162 which would be, we just plug it in, right? 2, 8 over 162 plus uh, 1 over 162, 8 over 162 plus 1. Okay, so something like that. So just to finish this up, p of 8 over 162 is equal to, uh, that's 4 over 8 over 81 plus uh, 1 over 9. So this would be 9 over 81 if you replace it, right? So you get p of 8 over 162 is 17 over 81. So there's our, sorry, our answer. So again, to refresh, we had three candidates, right? p of 0, which was 1. p of 1, which was a number bigger than 2 like it was 2.01 or something. And then our third answer, which is I think what our minimum is going to be, which is 17 over 81. I think that will be our our uh, our answer here. So let's highlight that in blue. Let's go ahead and use GeoGebra just to check on what we've done. So uh, the, the equation we're drawing is 2x plus 1 over 162x plus 1. So we get that. And we are looking only in the interval between 0 and 1. So sorry, this looks bizarre because it's way too uh, stretched out. Yeah, so you can see there's kind of like this unusual little... Okay. And so again, you know, you, you would do this, you would do f. So let, let's draw, um, you know, 0, g of 0, 1, g of 1. So those are the two things you know we, we checked at the beginning, uh, which of course are neither one of them are, are going to be our answer. And then we'll take the derivative of f. You could see there are two roots, right? One's positive, one's negative. Of course, we're not really dealing with the negative one. So let's go roots of f prime between 0 and 1. Hmm. Doesn't think there is one. OK, so root. There we go. So it found one at this, 0 0.494, which I believe is 8 over 162. Yeah. So we'll just round that to 10. Yeah. So that looks about right. Uh, okay. So anyway, so when you plug that number in, right, so uh, we're going to A and then F of A, which is this value, we get this number here. Now, the 2.099, I believe we represented as 17 over 81, which it turns out is right. Okay, so um, this one, you know, you end up with this answer 17 over 81, which just, you know, you find the specific minimum there. Again, same kind of question. We looked at the two endpoints. We looked at the critical point. The critical point was the lowest value, so that's the one that we kept. Now, uh, this gets a little bit trickier when the interval is open. Um, So you can see there's a couple of different options here, right? So 
one side is open, one side is... Uh... Okay, sorry. If it does, Sorry, I'm misreading this. The first one is just if it does not contain the endpoint. If that's what you have, you just do the same thing. But instead of saying the min is at the endpoint A or B, you just say it, it's it as it approaches that endpoint. Uh, but anyway, but the more important question here is this one, where n infinity and negative infinity are involved. So like one side of the function is not bounded, and in this, when you have this, you you get the you get the potential that an absolute extreme value does not exist. Okay, so if the interval is open ended on one side at least one side or both sides, it's possible that there are not going to be an extreme value. Uh, it, it is possible that there will, but it's possible that there won't. So the, you kind of your mind's got to be a little more open on these questions because there's kind of like more stuff we might need to check and look for. So what can we do if the interval is not closed? Remember when it said when I say not closed, um, I don't want you to think uh, really what 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 this means is if one side goes to infinity, right? Because uh, otherwise you still do the same thing we did above. Now, the first like subsection is if it only has one critical point. If you only find one critical point, right? Then that would mean so think about the function we just drew, for example. It only had one critical point. And and if you can check that that point is a minimum and there are no other critical points, then it stands to reason that that point must be the absolute minimum, right? Because think about it. If a function is, is starting up here in a positive region and then it approaches a minimum and then it, it bounces off that minimum and goes back up, and you know that there are no other critical points for you to look at, then you know that this has to be the lowest point, period, right? And this is true of, of you know, any, any question you're looking at where there's only one critical point. So for this, what I would want you to do is I'd want you to write down, you know, it's an open interval, but there's only one critical point, and I've proven that that point is a minimum or maximum, and therefore it's an absolute minimum or maximum. Okay, so uh, what you can do here is you find the critical point. This says you use the second derivative test. I don't think you need to use the second. You can use whichever derivative test you want. You can use the first or the second, right? This one is is showing you that it's you know it's concave up or it's concave down, and therefore it's the minimum or maximum. But remember, that's one of your choices. Your other choice is to check that the, the derivative changes signs on either side of your min or max value. Okay? Now, uh, it says if f double prime is zero, you have to use the first derivative test, so that's good. I think, yeah, I mean, the, one of the reasons you might want to use the second derivative test is it sometimes shows you that the whole interval is concave up or concave down and it kind of reinforces the idea that you that there is in fact only one critical point um, but yeah I mean if you're confident there's only one critical point then either test is fine you don't have to use uh, a specific test okay now uh, I I would ignore this I, I don't I would be careful about this because you know I'm just thinking of the. F I'm thinking of this function, right? So let me let me just take a second. You know, this one is saying if it has an absolute min, it can't have an absolute max. But like, what if we drew this one over x squared plus one? Now, this has an absolute max, right? The absolute max is here at one. Uh, does it have an absolute min? I mean, I guess not, right? Because it approaches zero. It doesn't actually reach zero. So yeah, maybe maybe we do agree. I don't know. I, I'd be a little bit cautious about this sentence, but I guess in the technical sense it is right because you can't find a point. That's the absolute lowest point. Anyway, okay. So then it says, okay, functions that have more than two critical points or two critical points, it just really should say more than one, you have to sketch. Okay, so there's really no, there's unfortunately no easy answer 
for this whole page, right? If there's one critical point, you're in luck. You just need to test that one critical point. If you find out it's a min, it's the absolute min. If you find out it's a max, it's the absolute max. But if there's more than one critical point, you have to sketch a graph. Like there's, there's just nothing else you can do. So you use your tools from last unit to sketch a graph. Okay. This one says find the absolute max and min values. I mean, this this is a quadratic. There's really no reason to. Okay, so let's say we're doing this. So we say it's open ended. So what we do is we check f prime x equals zero, and we look for one critical point. Right. So we do f prime x, which we get four minus two x. F prime of two equals zero. F prime of one is equal to uh, 2, which is a positive. f prime of 3 is equal to negative 2, which is a negative. Therefore, therefore, uh, f, uh, sorry, 2, 2 and, uh, what would that be? Um, 8 take away 4, 2, 4 is the absolute uh, max. Right, because before this point it was increasing, after this point it's decreasing, and that means uh, it's a max. Since there's only one critical point, critical point, uh, two four is the absolute max. Since it is a local max, and the only critical point on the function. Okay, so that that's an adequate proof for uh, this equation. There's only one critical point because f prime is linear. Linear functions only have one root. This f itself is a quadratic. It only has the one turning point. Therefore, if we find that it's a max, it's an absolute max. So quickly again, we'll draw this one for x minus x squared. Again, this is a function you're very familiar with. It just, you know, parabola that has an absolute max and that absolute max is located at 2, 4. Of course, there are easier ways to get that than what we just did but it's just here to demonstrate the method for you. Um, I think it might not be a bad idea to try just one more where we do the absolute value, absolute max of a, uh, a quartic. Um, let me just quickly make up a quartic here. So we go x minus 1, x minus 3, and x plus 2, and then we'll go integral h and then we'll say 4p expand q. Uh, okay, we'll say, uh, let's just see if there's an easy way to change this. Probably not. No. All right, so let's say we had this equation. So uh, x to the 4 minus 8, 8 over 3x cubed. So x to the 4 minus 8 thirds x cubed. Uh, minus 10x squared, minus 24x, and then let's just say there's a plus 1 on the end. Okay, so let's say f of x equals, and then here what we're supposed to do is find the uh, absolute min max of this function. Now, uh, this function, right, uh, it is a quartic, so let's say lim as x approaches uh, infinity is equal to infinity, right? It's positive infinity. If you if you like, it's a it's a it's a positive quartic that opens up, and the limit as x approaches negative infinity would also be positive infinity, right? So like it would go up on both sides. So that means, right? Sorry, I just actually type what I'm saying so don't get ahead of myself the limit as x approaches negative infinity is also positive infinity so like both sides are positive therefore the function must have an absolute min right because we know uh, it you know if it, if it goes up to infinity on both sides it has to have an absolute min so let's look at it get f prime of x and we'll take the derivative we get 4x cubed uh, minus 8x uh, sorry, excuse me minus yeah minus 8x squared minus 20x minus 24, right? And that would be our uh, 
uh, our derivative function. Now we want to set, we want to know when this equation is equal to zero. So we'll divide the whole thing by four, and we get two x squared minus five x minus six, right? And uh, looking to, you know, you did, to do this, you had to factor it, right? You have to uh, look for a number that makes the equation zero. The candidates are f of one. So, so again, I, I think the way we used to do it in advanced functions was p over q. So p, what are the possible values of p that could work here? Plus or minus one, two, three, and six, right? Those are the values that go into this six at the end. I think from looking at this, if I check negative one, I get negative one uh, take away two plus five take away six. That doesn't work. F prime of one, how about? I get uh, one, take away two, take away five, take away six. That doesn't work either. Uh, F prime of two, I get eight, minus eight, minus 10, minus six. Oh, this is strange. Okay, hold on, let me look at the actual equation. Should have worked with one. Let's take the derivative of r quickly. Okay, so I messed up my derivative here. Oh, how did I, what did I do? Sorry, just have a look here at what we did. Oh, sorry, it's not minus six, it's plus six. Sorry. So we go back to this one, right? Uh, f prime of 1, sorry, this is a silly mistake. Okay, so let's just go back for a sec. f prime of 1, we sub in 1, we get 1, take away 2, take away 5, plus 6, 7, take away 7, right? We get f prime of 1 equals 0, therefore x minus 1 is a factor. We do our division, right? Let's just make, a, we'll just quickly make up a synthetic division table here. So uh, we're dividing this cubic by uh, the number one. So the values are, I think I need one more, uh, just insert some more to the right. So again, if we're doing our synthetic division right, we would put uh, a the one, the negative two, the negative five, and the six. So the first thing we do is drop the one you make a downward arrow. Sorry. That was clearly not worth the time it took. Okay, one times one gives me a two, uh, excuse me, gives me a one. Negative two plus one gives me negative one. Multiply that by one, I get a positive one. Excuse me, I get a negative one. Add them together, get negative six. Multiply by one, I get negative six. Add together, I get zero, which is the remainder, which I expected because, of course, we're doing, uh, you know, we're, do, we're doing a factor. So we could say f prime of x is equal to x minus one, the factor, and then x squared minus x minus six. Right? The, the, those coefficients are just coming from here where the, the three coefficients go here, the positive one, the negative one, the negative six. So we, we've basically factored. And then we could say f prime of x is equal to one, yeah, sorry, x minus one, x minus three, and x plus two, right? Those would be the, the three things. So when we're looking for the absolute min, it must occur at f of one, f of three, or f of negative two, right? And if we think a little bit more about this equation, you should be able to come up with a reason why f of one is not the answer, right? Let's put them in order. So, let, sorry, let me put them in order. It'd be a little easier to make this point. Okay. You should be able to give me a reason why f of one is not worth checking. There's a reason we're not going to bother checking f of one, and I, I'm curious if you can figure out why that would be, 
right? We're talking about a quartic with three critical points. Why would the middle critical point not be worth checking? f of negative 2, right, gives us a value. f of 3 gives us a value. Let's find out what they are. So our original equation way back here. I'm just going to use GeoGebra to help me with this one. So let's uh, let's disappear the all the graphs and answers and stuff. So here's the quartic we're supposed to draw, right? Uh, and I'm supposed to sub in uh, negative 1, f of negative 1, uh, sorry, negative 2, and f of negative 2. Uh, right, <laughs> not f, sorry, r. There we go. Okay, so there's a one candidate, and then the other candidate we said was at uh, f of 3. So 3 and r of 3. And you can see both of them are minimums, but obviously b is quite a bit lower. It's negative 50, whereas c was negative 9. So you can get the absolute value, you know, negative 50.67, this is negative 9. So our, this would be our absolute min. Uh, there would be our answer. So you can do this with... Um, other questions. You just have to kind of use some of your knowledge from the way functions behave and what you know about them. If you don't know anything uh, specific to use about them, what you should be asking is do they only have one critical point? If they only have one critical point, then just find the min or max, say it's an open interval with one critical point, and then say since it's a local min or max, it has to be an absolute min or max. If it's a question like mine here where there are multiple uh, mins and maxes, uh, sorry, like this one here where we're doing the uh, the, the quartic. Um, you know, use your logic of what you know about polynomials. Find its end behavior. You know, if its end behavior is positive to negative, then your question's over. You're not going to find anything. If the end behavior is positive to positive, then you know you're going to find a minimum somewhere, right? So use your logic and, and sort of work on it that way. Uh, I'd like you to try the questions here from the homework and then again make sure you're using the discussion forum on the website to post any questions that you have.